Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Note Closure Show. Excited to have you guys here today. We are getting a little early start here because we have a very, very busy day here in the office. Uh, we are in uh, asset disposition mode. Uh, we just got in an exclusive tape of 20 assets, some performing, some non-performing. And uh, so we're working through that this morning as far as getting assets ready for you guys, if you're interested in bidding on these assets. Now, one of the great things is the seller of these assets that we've signed the exclusivity with is giving us reserve pricing so we'll know what kind of pricing to have on the performing and the non-performing notes for you uh so we're excited about that what you will see is we'll be doing a note uh live note auction next tuesday uh afternoon where we'll literally spend a couple hours going through each asset uh doing loan level due diligence for you guys We'll be breaking down the assets and giving you the opportunity to bid live. Now, uh, the great thing about this, if you've already signed an NDA, right, you'll be approved for pricing. Uh, we're only looking for direct buyers on this. Now, we've already got BPOs pulled on these. We've already got O&Es pulled on these. We've updated uh, statements on it. We've got pay, period, uh, pay strings, too, for you. So it's a really clean tape with some decent assets. I think the medium asset price is, what, 87000 something like that. So... Phenomenal. Uh, it's the start of something bigger. We'll be doing these note auctions uh, basically almost on a monthly basis going forward. This is the first one of the year. Um, it's been a few weeks in the works, right, everybody? Yeah. <laughs> Conference calls back and forth, get everybody comfortable with things, and uh, so we're excited about that. So that's why today's topic on uh, uh, the show today is performing versus non performing. All right? Now, I wanted to do some clarifications on that, uh, the difference between that. And, and I know it sounds pretty similar. Well, Scott, I know what a performing note is. Yes, you do, now, hopefully. It's a note that somebody's paying on time. Um, but there's two classifications of the performing that I like to talk about. A, uh, a true performing note is someone that's paid on time all the entire time. That works out really, really well. Okay. Unfortunately, we're not buying a lot of those. Okay. Uh, banks like to hold on to those. That's like their golden nuggets. That's what, how they base their banking system on, is on the performing notes. They bundle them together, sell them off into these big CMBS bonds and all this other stuff. That's how they make their money. What we are focusing on here and what we have is basically a re-performing notes. So it's loans that have been modified where the bar did go in default. Maybe they had a high interest rate at some point, couldn't afford it, got behind, uh, market crashed in their city or whatever state and somebody's reached out to them and got them on a payment plan of either a, a forbearance agreement a short-term or long-term modification and they've started paying on time for a period now i'm a big believer and many investors out there a big believer that a performing note especially a re-performing note is somebody who's paid on time at least 12 months that's what i look at things now what will happen sometimes is hedge funds will try to sell notes as performers with less than 12 months of seasoning, with six months, or even recently, a lot of hedge, uh, I won't say a lot, several hedge funds have been smoking some serious cracks saying, no crack. oh, yeah, this is a no crack zone. <laughs> no crack zone. Maybe when you go back and uh, modify it, you can put no crack zone pop up. All right. Um, where they're like, oh, the borrower is showing interest in a loan modification plan, but hasn't made a payment. And they're trying to sell it as a performer. I, I just don't believe in that. Uh, I think that's really smoking a lot of crack, no crack zone. All right. Um, you got to have 12 months, six months at least, if the borrower brought some serious skin in the game. You know, brought several grand downs, a down payment, and is back to work and things like that. Now, <clears throat> that's a performing note. Or, or re performers with 12 months of season, is rocking and rolling along. Hey, that's great. Um, now, some people have a very want to price it when they make offers on performing notes at non-performing bid prices, and it doesn't work that way. You've got to realize that if it's performing at a six, seven, ten percent yield, right? You know, as it's uh, the interest rate is where they're paying that, you're probably only going to see somewhere between a twelve to fifteen percent yield on your money. That means yes, you're still going to buy at a bit of a discount, but only expect that the hedge fund is going to you know, give you a little bit of a haircut or take a little bit of a haircut and sell it to you at a 15 yield. Now, how do you figure that yield? Well, what you do is you take the monthly payment, okay? Monthly payment divide uh, times 12. 
So if it's 600 bucks a month times 12 months, that's 7,200 coming in. Take that 7,200, all right, and uh, divide by a 15% yield, or you divide that by the purchase price of the note to figure the yield. Now, let's say the purchase price is <clears throat> 35,000, all right? Well, 7,200 divided by 35,000 is roughly about a 20% yield, okay? Um, that would be a little high, so they'd probably look for something closer to forty thousand dollars or forty-two thousand. So you know, seventy-two hundred divided by forty-two six, if that was the purchase price of the note, that would be equal to about a fourteen point six percent yield. So that's what you have to look at. Now, that's performing. Now, performing notes are great. Some people just like to buy notes, performing notes, because they want to get that. They're comfortable getting that twelve to fifteen percent yield. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a great business model. I call that not really. Being an active investor, but you know, you're like, that's passive investing. Hey, bam, what's going on? You don't have to do any foreclosures. You get the servicing transfer transferred from either the existing servicer to you, or you just keep it there and then just change who the payee is or who the person is handling the, um, who they, they, they pay out on behalf of the servicer. Now, non performing is people that aren't paying. Okay, that's straight up, that's pretty self explanatory, I think, right? Mm -hmm. So your pricing points on those are going to be more aggressive depending on a couple of different things. Well, one, what state is it located in is the first and foremost I would look at because if it's in a, a state that has a lot of demand, California, Arizona, Nevada, you're still not gonna see a big discount on those. You're still gonna see 90, 95% because the banks are smoking a lot of crack there, okay? If you can get a California asset below 70%, you are really doing well, okay? Does it, I, it doesn't happen very often, but it can happen for you occasionally. But we just don't see a lot of stuff in those neck of the woods. It's just too expensive. It doesn't make sense for us to waste our time on it because the price that I want, the bank or the seller is not going to appreciate. So like, I don't, I don't like paying about 50% of value on assets uh, that are over $50,000 in value because it's got foreclosure costs, servicing costs, taxes, maybe some repairs they won't modify. I've got to do the, the workout or my servicer or Polaris or JH Mortgage is going to do the workout for me by reaching out to the client or the, the the borrower trying to get them to reperform or come to some sort of resolution. You know, if I have to offer them cash for keys or hopefully get a deed and loom, maybe we can get a payoff. Maybe we can get them to do a short sale. Or if I've got a foreclose, you know, I'm going to uh, expense out, have some expenses out on attorney fees. And that's the second thing. So what state's it in? Is it occupied or vacant? Occupied, you have more excess strategies. Vacant, you're probably going to foreclose or cash for keys. I personally like occupied assets, and all these at 20 assets are occupied, right? Correct, guys, based on the spreadsheet? All 20. All 20 are occupied, so that's a good bonus aspect of it. All right. Um, <clears throat> occupied means I have the opportunity to help potentially modify forbearance. If it's in a state that has hardest hit funds, maybe I can get the hardest hit funds to kick in. Uh, if I can get them to start a uh, forbearance agreement or start modification, maybe I can... Well, I don't even know if it got extended the FHA 1023 program. I got to check into that, see if that was uh, extended this year. But there's more extra strategies when it's occupied. So there we go. States, occupancy, I look at values. Uh, usually the next thing, um, I don't like bidding on a low valued asset, sub $20,000 in value. Um, yeah, you can make good returns on those, but I'd rather my money be invested in, a, in or somebody else's money invested in a higher valued asset because, A, if the air conditioner grows legs and walk off or the copper goblins show up and strip the property if it does become vacant yeah copper goblins yeah uh, um, you've got those expenses and AC is still gonna cost you three grand at least if not five grand per house if you got to put a fridge in the property it's gonna cost uh, the same amount no matter what you know depending on the value of the house so that's what you have to realize the higher valued assets if you can get those at 50 45 percent of value it gives you more cushion for uh, you know mistakes that can happen because there's always going to be a uh oh along the way, um, you know states are important. I would get rid of the states I don't like and just focus on the states I like. I like occupied assets, but I will sometimes do unoccupied if it's condos in Florida, I like uh, Florida condos for the non-performing stuff. Uh, value obviously in condition. You're going to look at the condition of the property. You know if it's in it trashed out, it looks like it's trashed out. I would avoid it. If you look online and the pictures online are old. Uh, and have boarded up windows, I guarantee it's not improved in value over the year or six months since that photo was taken. Um, always look at the dates. Always, yes, thank you very much. You read my mind. Look at the dates. 
Um, if it's a three-year-old photo, you definitely won't put eyes on it. If it's a six-month-old photo, eh, maybe you can get away without putting eyes on it. I still would just to make sure uh, vandalism hasn't taken place. <laughs> Migrants haven't moved into the property and are stealing power from the next-door neighbors. So that has happened. So, But your pricing is going to vary, too, on non-performing based on occupancy, based on state, based on foreclosure timeframes. And that's one of the great things about the take, too, is we've got updated status if it's active foreclosure, active bankruptcy, um, that's on there, um, expected foreclosure dates. Those are also on this tape that we're going to be talking about and, and showing you guys over the next few days. So uh, excited about that. Um, why, does, why is the <clears throat> foreclosure dates important? Well, it lets you know how much longer you are in the process. Uh, you've got to you know, be on the hook for foreclosure costs. When you, can you expect to have it as either an REO to resell or if you can sell it at the foreclosure auction is also an exit strategy, or take the property back either as a rental or something that you would own or finance. So we, uh, you know, non-performing has much more exit strategies, got more flexibility on things versus the performing notes. Um, I don't like buying non-performing notes where we're not gonna see at least a 20, 25% yield on our end. That means I've got to show a 20, 25% yield to my investors as well if we're doing equity splits or if they're making a flat return, it gives me a little more flexibility of somewhere in the 30% yield range if I can give them a 10 to 12% return. So, any questions this morning yet from people, Nicole? Uh, Brian Gilbert likes non-performing notes. Um, you were talking about Arizona and California earlier. Cody Cox was talking about the green state of Oregon. Yes, the green. The green state of We're not talking about oregano up there. Uh, Matthew... Marinoff. Marinoff, yeah. Uh, he says pretty interesting stuff about the non-performing versus the uh, performing. Yeah, now Matt, Matt Marinoff is is very good uh, at non-performing. He's a short sale, I would say, king. Let's get the point because you got to have the finger point at the screen for Matt Marinoff. Um, <laughs> if you need a great short sale guy, he's your guy up there, man. I think he was working until 11, 11.30 last night on a file. But uh, non-performing definitely has uh, a lot more variables when it comes to it. And the thing you have to keep in mind, this is the thing that's frustrating sometimes with people, is you have to expect to have, if you're brand new, your acceptance ratio is probably going to be around 10 to 20% on the offers you put in. You know, that means you've got to put in 10 offers to get really one approved, or 20 offers to get one approved. Initially, uh, what's great about those offers is you want to be a little bit different on those. You can't all be low balls. I mean, if you are low balls and getting accepted, hey, kudos to you. <laughs> Uh, that's a good thing, but hopefully the assets aren't trashed out. What I always like to see, especially when we have our mastermind, and I see new people making offers on assets that the experienced people make offers on. So that's always a good thing. It means they're bidding on the same assets. They're coming up with similar pricing that they've learned from me very well. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully it's from me. <laughs> but it gives them an opportunity to say, okay, I'm I'm in the ballpark. I'm in the right range. I'm doing the things I should be doing. 20 assets, yeah, it's not a huge tape. It's the start of a, a thing. We expect to have stuff that's going to be 50, 60, 70 you know, assets or more going forward each month with this group. And so we're pretty excited about that. But, you know, if you like performing, great. Um, now, if you've got an investor, this is something to keep in mind. If you guys have IRA investors, people looking to make 7, 8% return on their money, and you can buy a performing asset at 15. It gives you some flexibility in there to buy that note and still be able to pay your investors a 7 8% return, and you yield the difference in between. So that's one thing we've done in the past, and that's a great way to get some cash flow coming in um, initially without having to do a lot of expenses, a lot of work. You're just basically the servicers paying you monthly. You're trying to cut a check um, to your investors at their, their return, and everybody's happy. That's a great way to really come in without having to put a lot of money out um, also a great way to raise some capital, especially if you're dealing with self-directed IRA investors in your neck of the woods or out networking at real estate clubs. I was very impressed. I saw a lot of people last night, I guess, uh, would be Wednesday nights. Uh, a lot of the first investment clubs are hitting for the year. People going out and uh, spending time at the real, local real estate club. I saw several people uh, at the Central Florida Real Estate Investment Group, Jennifer uh, Murtry and a few others. Uh, Robbie Woods, I guess, gave a presentation on an empty lot, did it really well from the NBA podcast. Good for him. Um, um, Kimberly Banks Fawcett had a large group on last night in her Dallas DFW group that Chase Thompson presented on. 
about goal setting. So uh, check her out. There's a replays up if you want to catch that. Uh, I, a lot of people were commenting posts about, oh, I need to readjust my goals and things like that for the year. So excited to see that as well. So um, the biggest thing I can tell you guys is this year is off and running. You're going to see a lot of product. Uh, from our end, moving out, you just got to be ready to roll and ready to close. Now, on these deals, since all the due diligence is basically done, BPO, O, and E, I mean, the biggest thing you'd have to do is have a drive-by done, check your taxes, and, and be ready to rock and roll. So closings will be t basically a week, uh, very fast. Get things done, double-check your numbers, get things closed, and, and um, be off and running and going from there. So any other questions, comments, concerns from people? Not today. I know it's early, get a little earlier start because we've got a little bit of a, a very busy schedule, so we want to knock this out early versus yesterday because it was pretty late. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh. All right, guys, well, we'll wrap that up for the day. Hopefully, uh, do me a favor. If you like this, make sure to share this to your uh, uh, shirt on your pages or the pages you manage. We love seeing people dive into this. You can always go to weclosednotes.com and opt in uh, and be alerted of different uh, deals we got going on. Uh, make sure you opt into that if you want to make sure and get on that list of, uh, uh, on the notification of the note auction. Now what we'll do, as I'll send an email out today, um, we will do a webinar Monday night on a topic and we'll preview these assets. So Nicole, you're working on a video today. You guys are working on photos, pulling photos off the BPOs to help people get excited and a little of a BAM! You know, start wafting, start smelling. The, can you smell the returns that you possibly get there? Smell, deal. smell the deal flow, baby. So, all right, guys. Have a great uh, Thursday afternoon, and we'll see you guys on the next Closure Show tomorrow morning, everybody.